Well, hello. It's another month again, and welcome to the first virtual monthly reading. Uh, our two wonderful features are Lois P. Jones and Melissa Stuttern, and we our custom is to begin with our features. So, wow, I have a lot of people to let in. So, um, Jim, I wonder if you could, after I let in these last lot, whether you could let some people and I could make you co-host. That would be great. All right, let me do that right now before anything else happens. There we go. There you go. I made you co-host. No, I didn't All work. Right. No, I, it's for some reason. Yeah, it I'm made... on this Zoom. Booyah, chicken. There or... you go. Now I am. All right, more and more people coming in. All right, so um, we'll begin with Lois P. Jones. Lois Lois's work won honors in the 2021 Bridgeport Poetry Prize and is forthcoming in the Bridgeport Poetry Anthology. She was a winning finalist for the 2018 Terrain Poetry Contest judged by Jane Hirschfield. Other awards include the 2018 Lascaux Single Poem Prize, the 2017 Bristol Poetry Prize judged by Liz Berry, and the Tiferet Poetry Prize. Jones has work published or forthcoming in Poetry Wales, Plume, Guernica Editions 2021, Valentine Mitchell of London 2021, Verse Daily and Narrative. Her first collection, nice Night Ladder, was published by Glasslear Press in 2017 and listed for several awards. Jones is the poetry editor of Kyoto Journal and a reader for the Kingsley Tuff Awards. Go ahead, Lois, thank you. Take it away. <laughs> Hi, boy, oh my gosh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Bobby, um, for arranging this. I'm really honored to be here with my dear friend, Melissa, and with all of you who come to join us and Robbie, you're such a, um, a fine literary citizen and an amazing poet. So I appreciate you out there in the community. Um, I've really had some struggles with what to read today <laughs> because, you know, there's always the darker side and then there's kind of what you want to put your attention on now. And I think I'm going to stay with um, mostly with the Rilke project that I've been working on over the past few years. But I'm going to start with a poem um, that was written, an ekphrastic poem written on um, Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe. And I came across some research from a woman who'd gone to the area and interviewed people. She was really wanting to know what happened with Van Gogh's ear. And so I started to become really fascinated with the subject. And she brought up some very interesting um, details, one of which was a quote, uh, which is in the epigraph that says, keep this object carefully, which apparently he said. So self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe, 1889. Not to shock the prostitute whose flower you'd recently splashed poppy red, already crusting on its crown. Not because many years worm bore its way into your mind or how the paint you drank from the brush jar drew you down its dim well. Not that you sliced your left ear with a razor when Theo told you he was to marry Jovan. 
not even a recent theory, that in a fit of anger, Gauguin flicked off the lobe with his rapier and blood splattered carmine, stifling your shoes, already confused with too much pigment. It's still a mystery, sticky as tallow. Believe what you wish. Perhaps as Levis suggested, the, the woman placed the ear on a windowsill yeah. to listen for her. Whether to comfort or terrify, he didn't say. But yesterday, as I walked the moss-ridden path, I saw a single calla lily listening from the forest floor, sheltered by the pines and surrounded in jade, looking white as an apology. So the next one um, takes us into my trip in 2017, where I went on a residency to a little town of Trele, Switzerland, which is about two hours from Museau, where Rilke lived um, the last six years of his life, and um, also happens to be near Geneva, which I lived on and off in. So it was a real a kind of a pilgrimage to go back there and revisit some of the haunts that I'd been to. And one of my favorite, favorite places was a medieval village called Ivoire. And um, I said, if I ever get married again, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to Ivoire and that, and that is where it's gonna be. And everybody's gonna have to, to fly there. So um, this is a, poem that is a dialogue poem between my friend who went with me uh, to Geneva and to Museau in Rerum, where Rilke was buried. And yeah, so it, it includes both her voice and mine. Ivoire. And here, is the castle. It juts from land like an ancient warlord as the lake gathers diamonds in its hem. All is quiet, except for the dogs, <laughs> except for the bells ringing the hour as we are brought through courtyards of stone. Shop fronts offer jeweled fingers to us waiting to be kissed Arched lids flutter open to lace and vases and the bare shoulders of the shop girl. How long has she stood in her flowery shift, wearing flesh like a summer storm? After all, it's not the robes, but the body they are designed to express as with the hens on our way to the water's edge, each a proud rough of feathers and a short stab of beak. These egg bearers, regal ladies in their autumn robes, holding the shell's internal verb. Yes, here we are in France, the blue well of Lac Le Mans between ourselves and Switzerland. Gulls circle as we reach the bench, short nasal barks, a local dialect. Something of the water gets inside, alters the blood. Perhaps their veins run with the lake's ink. Will our voices also be changed by it? We take a table at Bar Restaurant de Pêcheur, gulls roosting inside our cheeks. We eat as they call to the wind, peer into our throats for ice summits to navigate by. Our breath, the thermals of Mont Blanc, as words flick from the flinching fish of our tongues. <laughs> so my journey with um, this project 
began before I heard about Frieda Baumgartner, who was Rilke's uh, last housekeeper and lived with him from 1921 till around 1926. And there was a woman by the name of Lenny. Uh, I'm not gonna read that poem now, but she stayed with him at a, at the little castle of Schlossberg in Zurich. And I came across a letter where he mentioned her and he said, she's, she's hardly, you hardly can tell she's there. She's, she never asked me anything and she never seemed surprised at anything. She has a presence that is, so to speak, climatic. And I began to think of this living in that same space with him, with a poet who is devoted to silence and spent so many years um, isolated so that he could do his work. And then I, I did a little bit of research and I came across a memoir in German, this little vague little pamphlet stapled um, on the internet and traced it down, found a copy of it in Japan gave it to, um, to a friend of mine, Eva West, who's here today and actually is from Switzerland and, did a, and she did a beautiful translation of it. So, um, so this first poem starts with Frida on the train for the first time she's going to meet him. And it begins with a little quote from Frida. Against all expectations, I, a young and inexperienced girl, was selected out of many applications to keep house for the poet Greiner Maria Rilke at Museau. And by the way, there was no running water and no electricity uh, in this old 13th century chateau. The sky is complicated and flawed, and we're up there in it, opening its letters, crossing countries to clean someone's clouds, crossing mountains stacked with chanting, stacked with secrets, strange tongues that want to define us, that refuse to taste us. As in tasting the last honey dipped slice of apple on this train, I watch the sun spark rivers without faces, watch my face disappear in the passenger window, disappear like Borges and never return. He won't believe I've read Borges, won't believe I can attend to his silence. Silence is a letter you never open, a ball of yarn knitting sky in a corner. What we want, we fashion. Fashion the proper weather for our wanting. Wanting what is always made of what we cannot make ourselves. There are his blue eyes in the window. He makes what I want. I will fashion what he needs. I will make a cowbell of wishes. I will not ring it. So the next poem, um, Frida comes downstairs in the middle of the night and discovers a strange uh, apparition or person um, down in the living area. And it's called Frida's Glove Chateau Museau Summer 1922. And it starts with a quote from The Poetics of Space by Bachelard. And he says, the poet Rilke enjoyed donning his made suede gloves and dusting furniture in the wee hours of the morning. Like caressing the body of a lover. After this, Rilke said, there's nothing that you do not know. A candle burned inside my brow. I could not pinch its flame, so I 
crept out of the fevered bed to the forest of our floors and their green against my feet. I saw only a hand at first, moving up the velvet drapes, independent as a whistle from nowhere. A thin figure appeared, fingers and thumb gliding up the drape's edge, something at the wrist, a thickness, and between the fingers like a new skin, a fourchette with a slight webbing that layered the delicate hand. My suede glove moved slowly up the plated cord, then down. One finger drew a line from forehead to neck, and I felt as if it traced my own throat, down to the clavicle, then up to the edge of my left lobe. I shivered. The moon shook too, so sewn to the poet's mind that the fabric of our scene tilted, then buried itself in the night's scene. So, um, so this is the last poem I'm going to um, read. I'm sorry. Um, you've run out of minutes. <laughs> I oh. I hate to stop you, but this is this is my last poem. So, um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Only the moon holds her exits and entrances, Museo, 1921. I don't believe what my body says, the whole of me too tall for most men, my voice a wounded animal, a body that holds forks and knives and pokers for the fire, blue coals alive as dusk. I don't believe its cries and moans and cracks of thunder hush between the lips. If an orchid transforms from hard bulb by the grace of rain and light, let it find flowering in the moist ground of your silence. Let it bloom not from photosynthesis, but desire. And let this body enter holding love under the tongue its sublingual light, a faint disc against the shift to rose, dissolving and lighting this throat. Let the body be the beautiful dark butterfly coming expressly toward you from the dimly shining windows in a ballroom of gas. Let me slip between the cracks of your closed door to be touched the way the butterfly holds your finger landing soft as sorrow, as rain. Thank you. Thank you so much for your beautiful set. Our next feature is Melissa Stutter. She's the author of two poetry collections, I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast and Dear Selection Committee, which is forthcoming. Uh, it was forthcoming last summer and I suppose might still be forthcoming. I don't know. Maybe she didn't update this. And the chapbook, Like a Bird with a Thousand Wings. Her work has been featured on PBS, NPR, The New York Times, The Guardian, and the Academy of American Poets Poet a Day series. And has also appeared in periodicals such as Poetry, Kenyon Review, Psychology Today, New Ohio Review, Harvard Review, Missouri Review, Swim, Daily, and New England Review. Her awards included the Penn Review Poetry Prize, the Tom Howard Prize from Winning Writers, the Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, and more. Take it away. Thank you, Robbie. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here today. And um, Robbie, I just want to say off the bat, I so appreciate everything that you do in the literary world, including this. And, um, you know, I know that it, it takes a little time away from your own creativity to be doing these things for everyone all the time. And I really appreciate it. 
And uh, also, I'm so honored to read with Lois today. She's a dear friend of mine, and um, I'm just, you know, hang on to every word that she reads for dear life. I mean, sometimes it feels like that's what poetry is for us right now. So thank you, Lois, for that beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, and I have to say, I love not just your words, but your voice too. You have such a lovely spirit and it really comes through, you know, your voice and your reading and everything. So um, I can clarify about the publication. I actually um, just put the wrong year on that, Robbie. I'm sorry. It's summer of 22 that the book is coming out. So that book, Dear Selection Committee, is coming out this May and I'm very excited about it. So um, I, if you can't tell already, have a touch of ADHD. <laughs> uh, so I heard people talking right before the reading about how, you know, whether they work on one thing at a time or a bunch of different things all at the same time. And I'm always working on so many different projects at the same time. So I figured I'd read a little bit from each of my books. Um, and I am setting my timer so that I don't go over 15 minutes because I'm so <laughs> worried about doing that. So um, the first poem is from this book, which is my older book, I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast, and it's called Daughter, and um, it's pretty self-explanatory. So it's for Rosalind. Because I was a cave and you were the bird that flew through my hollows. When they bathed the pain away, the light on your face looked like peace after a long and onerous war. I knew then what it meant to conjure fire from two sticks, to be an ocean giving life to a wave, to invent the wheel and its axle, unwind torque, create a perfect language from gurgles and sighs. Your body was a new and sacred space. I was a universe cooling after a great expanse. And because bright cells clung together to be you, I could believe I built the ark that saved humanity and animals walking two by two, that I'm the one who sat beneath the Bodhi tree and begot the sacred fig of enlightenment. I tell you, Athena sprung from my own split head. Because emergence is a teaching. Because your hands and feet were softer than sand. Because before there were canyons or valleys or lakes or winds, you curled your hand around my finger and with your touch delivered the awe. So my next poem is from this book. This is a newish sort of chat book. Um, it was in collaboration with the musician, Christopher Theophanides and um, an artist, Alyssa Vendramen. And actually I have a blurb from Lois on the back of it. <laughs> and also my friend Kelly who's here. So um, this book is basically based on the um, Conference of the Birds by Atar. So if you know that story, it's about a group of birds speaking a spiritual, seeking a spiritual seeker. So seeking a spiritual leader, sorry. Um, so this poem is called, There's a Brightness Folded Into Every Bird. I can't believe I got so tongue-tied, that was so funny. There's a brightness folded into every bird but the bird doesn't know it. The bird is 30 birds who soared out of dreaming to invent sky. 30 birds flying in the formation of a bird. God tells them, open, O moonbeak, O silver black, O sliver of luck. And the bird says, break me until I'm whole. God says, empty, and the bird spills a splendor of jewels from their 30 beaks into the valley. Don't think I'm a diamond, God says, find me. And hands the bird a map back to the inside of its own bone, then disappears. But the bird doesn't understand the question. 
30 birds split into a thousand that search under everything, stone, fabric, sun face, gold, until they find no God. Now the beak yells, take me, I have no reason. And an arch of wing lifts sun up towards light and a thump under the chest answers yes and yes and yes and yes. So thank you. <laughs> the next poem is called Philomela's Tongue Says. And this is from a project that I'm working on about the mythological character Philomela. And she, if you know this myth, she um, was raped by her sister's husband. And then um, when she tried to talk about it, he um, cut out her tongue. So it's not so nice, but it's, for me, it largely symbolizes um, the disempowerment um, that comes along with such an act. And, um, you know, kind of focusing on the aftermath of the story and the sort of trauma that follows and how that is sometimes as bad, oftentimes as bad as the thing itself. So um, Philomela's tongue says, Philomela's tongue says you could mistake grief for a diamond the way it shines when cut into, like fish eyes in a boat's drain. The eyes fly into death, seeing everything, the cloud of alcohol and Sagittarius B2, the 10 billion trillion trillion carat diamond in Centaurus, the soul swimming through the air with its tie hanging silver beneath it like a kite string. But Philomela's tongue does not die. Shards of memory fall through her, finding muscle at the shore where blood meets vein, cutting the string that's kept her sanity tied to the root. In its place, mute swans lie dormant beneath frozen lakes of scar. Tarius says she cannot say what happened. She says silence writhes inside the walls of truth, like a fox thrashing hot in a hound's jaws, or a riled fly frantic to escape the hand that carries it to safety. So thank you, <laughs> you're so supportive, I love it. Um, so the next poem I wanna read is from a forthcoming book, Dear Selection Committee, which we talked about earlier. And it's called Inside the Beige Brick House, The Beige Rooms. And um, the, the title is also the first line. So inside the beige brick house, the beige rooms and beige shirted people sit beautiful as unbuttered biscuits, their awful loveliness upon me. They want me drier than wheat and so still no marbles can roll from my head. I want summer flashing the yard red with begonias. I want ladder-backed woodpeckers knocking at the gables and crepe myrtle blossoms blown down like hot pink cotton in a storm. I'm embarrassing like that. A walking faux pas no one wants to be seen with at the mall. I know compassion like the arms of a cactus. I know the scent of earth revealing her secrets after a much needed rain. I buried everything they told me to bury. Then I dug it up again. I think that's kind of what we do with our poetry to a certain extent, isn't it? <laughs> we dig up everything that, that we've been told to bury. And it's, uh, it's such a connecting thing. I mean, I, this poetry community really sustains me, you know, reading people's work and coming to these readings and hearing people, um, you know, voice the things that I'm sometimes afraid to say uh, is just, you know, it, it helps me survive. <laughs> so, um, okay, the next poem is also from Dear Selection Committee. Committee. It's called In the House, I Built Another House. In the house, I built another house, and that was my body, made of wine, pills, 
and regret, made of cigarettes and self-blame. Smoke and baby cries leaked from all the windows. The baby's face was a red fist punching nothing. Then the doctor said pregnant, and I said, I'll never be good enough. And the doctor said, the baby is not yet a baby. I said, I am the baby. I went home and built another house, one that my husband could not enter, a fortress of withdrawal. He drank for both of us. I started making bones. You. Um, let me see. So a couple of years ago, my daughter and I were in a, a car accident. Um, someone just sort of stopped on a highway, was like completely stopped. And we came through um, an underpass that was sort of obscured because of some construction and ended up hitting into this car and I broke my ribs. <laughs> and this is a poem about what it felt like when my ribs were broken. The pain is so resplendent, it has babies. And its babies are so resplendent, they have babies. Underage, unwed babies having babies. Someone has built their delivery room in my ribs and without restraint, they come and go, carrying babies that will birth more babies in the parking lot before realizing they are babies. Flamboyant babies refusing the swaddle of pink and blue. They leave the hospital in sequined evening gowns to perform the burlesque of pain. And everyone in the audience has their shirts unbuttoned to nurse the babies they carry everywhere. And the speakers, instead of making sound, make babies. And the curtains open and close on a pulley of pain operated by the babies. And when the magician comes on stage, she saws the pain in half. And there are two more pains that saw themselves in half. And now the pain knows how to saw itself to make more pain. And there are pain babies everywhere. And there are no rabbits or doves in the hat, just more babies. And when the cocktail waitress comes around, she serves little cups of pain, shots of pain with pain backs on the rocks and pain crudités on leafy green beds of pain. And when I tried to leave the show to go home, the MC announces my next set. And I realize it was just me on stage all along, having babies and babies and more babies with no epidurals. I realize it is me who has conceived and mothered and nurtured my pain all along. So obviously that became about a lot more than <laughs> the physical pain that I was feeling. Um, I, I think, uh, I was also thinking a little bit about how we protect ourselves in order to avoid getting hurt, but by doing that, we hurt ourselves. Um, so yeah, um, I, I'll read two more poems. Um, let me see. Uh, then, trying to decide what I want to read next. I'll read Migration Patterns, um, which is also from the forthcoming book, Migration Patterns. In the dream, I tell customs my llama is a goat, because sometimes the heart is not large enough to hold what is beautiful if the mind finds it exotic. Sometimes the mind mistakes itself for a hoarded piece of land and little campfires spring up everywhere. Smoke slinks through chain link. Small hands and shoulders capsize beneath a dehydrated, salt-sick sun. In the dream, I carry mountains through international waters. I carry the hills, their babies, to safety. Sometimes I wave away a predator and there is fire in my hand and my hand does not want to be part of a human body. It wants to belong to the llama, the goat, the hills, the mountain. In the dream, I've got the North Star in my trunk. I'm driving it across a border. I'm taking it to a different part of the sky. It can't stand what it has seen. 
What we need is not a fixed point. What we need is a world anthem that everyone knows the words to. One that says, come in, come on, come over, I've got you. In the dream, light leaks from thin cracks where the trunk door meets the body of the car. The star says, put me on the dashboard and I will guide you. The officer says, illegal. You can't take a star to another part of the sky. And I say, watch me. I say, I've got enough light to do anything. And my final poem is also from Dear Selection Committee. It's called Untitled. <laughs> Does everyone have a poem called Untitled? I think we all should. <laughs> My address is nostalgia for things that never happened. I wander in and out of coincidence, dragging a wagon full of unrequited lovers behind me. I visit the infirmary for broken planets and ill poets, where I bandage metaphors and remove stitches from busted couplets. All will be well again. Poets restored to their regular neurotic tendencies, free to enter emotional and psychological terrain that would make others run panicked from the landslides inside their own minds. Oh, what we embrace to avoid the life we've been given. Oh, what we embrace to live the life we've been given. Call everything you've ever done untitled. It's the untitled. It's the only honest way to create. Generate a disaster in your life to sidestep the true catastrophe of your life. Oh, there's a universe with a bell around its neck purring outside your bedroom door. Let it in. Oh, I tried to make this about you, but it's about me, me, me. My awful claws, my electric arch, bats and blue jays hunted from trees. I thought I was good, but I never was. I'm coming home with a bleeding angel between my teeth. Open the door to the heart store. Imperfection is the only muse. And I am her handmaiden. Please love me anyway. Thank you. I am so looking forward to the open mic. <laughs> Thank you so much for that beautiful set of poems i mean one line after another was gorgeous Thank and you. both of you together it's you know a surfeit of loveliness um we can start uh on the open mic i do apologize if you if my cat starts yowling he isn't feeling very well today and he's been throwing up all morning so i apologize in advance should that happen our first person at the open mic uh, is Dick Westheimer. But before Dick starts, uh, please, if you'd like uh, to our features, please put links to your books up so people can get some for themselves if they don't already have them. I'd really appreciate it because I didn't think to do it myself. Thank you. So our first reader is Dick Westheimer, and it's um, two poems or five minutes. Well, I was totally taken off guard because I didn't know I had signed up for an open mic, but I always have poems available. So I'll read the one that's at the top of my uh, um, top of my desktop here. Um, <clears throat> it's called The Poem in the Mirror. The face I can't forget is mine in the mirror at 3 a.m. when I see these tired eyes that have stared so long at the empty space at the end of a line of one poem on one page where I've searched for one word, a true word, the perfect word that will make this stanza sing like the ring of a Saxon's hammer, echo like a verb tumbled from Babel's tower one 
barked and spit by Kurds and Cossacks and Frankish queens. One that will make this single line of this friendless verse strike me day blind, like a limb split from a tree, like a lightning clap outside my window. I've sat so long, sullen at my desk. My feet have grown roots, my arms wooden, heavy like logs, my hands taut as a snapped branch. The only sound I hear is the lead from my pencil cracked off as I press too hard, try to spade a word from the page, from my brain, from somewhere. So I walk to the bathroom to pee and startled to see the word I searched for, or rather the entire poem in the mirror, a reflection of the me who was made by the poem which reads me to sleep becomes a dream which will rouse me in the night, haunt me with that one word I've sought. Awakened, I turn to the bedside table, switch on the lamp, grab my pad, and find my pencil still broken. I slump back to a dreamless drowse and wake to find the line was already there, grown from the loam of leaves left rotting under the bed, I'd made from the tree I had become. Thank you. I'm glad that one was at the top of my page. Thank you very much. Uh, our next reader is Mark Petrie. Hello. Uh, first, I want to thank Donna Hilbert. Um, Donna, your blurb is on the back of my book of poems that came out last year, and I really appreciate your effort, and I appreciate all that I've heard from you over the last 20 years. Uh, Lois, I got to hear you last night read that invocation of Thich Nhat, Thich Nhat Hanh, and it really impressed me that you chose to read something that was really beautiful, not your own. Melissa, you are one of the most brave people I have ever heard in a long time. Brave, brave, brave. You keep preaching, sister. I mean, that was really gorgeous. I'm gonna read two quick poems. This first one is a persona poem I've never read before. It came to me while I was writing my first novel and I have no idea who the character is, but I fell in love with her. So this poem is called Alan. A young redheaded guy who reminded me of you, Alan, walked up to me with a swagger, asked me to dance. When we danced, he looked at me with a smile curled at the corner like yours. We went out to the patio and smoked a joint, taking in the bonfires on the beach and the white foam rising out of the dark sea. He asked me to walk on the beach. I wanted to walk with you, Alan, but you had flown away like a bird to another's nest and September was closing in, on October. He kissed me a couple times, laid me in the sand, entered me. It wasn't you, Alan, my eyes closed. I wept inside. I wept my clear dead eyes dry until he finished. He asked me for my phone number. I gave him yours. I walked to the edge of the sea, took off my jeans, threw my soiled panties into the surf, fell down to my knees, my head in my hands. I retched and vomited the taste of the redhead out of my system. I called for you, Alan, between each spasm, called out your name into the rolling surf. You did not answer. Remember how we held each other, how we were such sweet lovers. Oh, Alan, God damn you and all men like you. Oh, Alan, I can't say how much I love you. I shiver with shame and shake with loneliness as I slip my naked legs back into my jeans. <clears throat> and um, this is a poem called The Way Home. <sighs> my life didn't start until 1987 when I met Amy and found myself I should remember that forever. Whenever life spits bitter seeds my ways, 
Otherwise, a washed up never has been could never have found his way home, much less given up the bottle, the pills, and the anger. Anger is the hardest to part with. I wake up at 2.30 a.m. to a pillow covered with cold sweat, leaving a bed with my lover holding my hand. I lay on the living room sofa, awake until morning's first gray light seeps through the slats in the blinds. When I return to the bedroom, Amy strokes my arms, chest, and forehead, sweet talked me back to sleep. I wake up to a new day around 8 a.m. and take our son to summer school. This is not a confession. It is a love poem. All right, um, Penelope is our next reader. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm really enjoying the reading today. Um, Lois and Melissa, I'm gonna, when, when the recording is up, I wanna hear you again. There's a lot to absorb there. Um, I'm gonna read two short poems. One was published in Burst Virtual a few months ago, um, and I've since revised it almost completely. So <laughs> here's the new version. Fret work, he wrote on the first page, and nothing more. On the back of the notebook, prices for saw blades, phone numbers, the date and time of an Alzheimer's talk. Dismantling his stockpiles so she'll know that he's gone. She gives me his spiral for poems. And the second poem um, has just been published in Gyroscope Review and is called One World to Another. To slide under the surface without panic, you must tire yourself out or Every sliver of streetlight seeping through the blinds is an ice pick. Every thump of heavy-footed neighbor in the corridor means tsunami. You want to sink before the storm arrives. Once you're underneath, moved into that other world, you're safe, can ride the currents from one ecosystem to another. Undulating kelp forest, to fin jewels darting through coral, sunlit tide pool to where fish carry their own lanterns through the dark. A speck catches afternoon light like a slow moving comet. You're there and then you're gone. Thank you for listening. Our next reader is Caitlin Buxbaum and I want to acknowledge uh, that she's been putting information about our features um, into the um, into the chat. So um, thanks a lot and go ahead and read your poems. Thanks, Robbie. Everybody hear me okay? I got a new setup, so I wanna make sure I'm connected to the right microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, so I haven't been here in a while. It's good to be back and see some familiar faces, hear some good work. I thought I would read a couple poems in Press Pause Press from a couple months ago. And I put the link in the chat so you can read them later if you want or read them while I'm reading them. Um, there's three. The first one is an American sentence. So I'm gonna, it's really short. I'm going to skip that one though and go to the the longer poems. And the first one of the longer poems is called Look Up. Whatever steals you away from your smartphone for an hour or two, hold on to that. Whether it's watching a chick flick or lying on the bathroom floor with your best friend discussing your hopes and dreams, hold on to it. You never know when you'll look back and hindsight will be 2020 because you forgot to look up from your Twitter puns, Instagrammable lunches, and Facebook resolutions at the time, which has suddenly passed you by. And the second one, on a similar theme, 
is called gratification. Social media has given us expectations that were never meant to be met, or at least not in the time frame we now demand. We've forgotten what it means to write a letter and wait for the reply, not assuming its absence is anything personal. And there are no likes, emojis, DMs, or comments, no followers or friends to amass for status or credibility in that kind of correspondence. But on a good letter's arrival, there is simply, importantly, delight at having waited and received, having been patient and later rewarded. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, our next reader is Susan Rogers. There you go. Hi, thank you, Robbie. And um, thank you, um, Melissa, for your beautiful reading of Lois, of course, always. Um, it's an honor to be here. I, I'm sorry, I, I spaced out and I was fixing my phone when I heard your beginning of this. So are we able to read two poems or how does that work? Or... Two poems or five minutes. Okay, great. So um, I'd like to read um, two poems and the second one is gonna be a high boon. And the first one is a poem that's um, for princess, uh, the former princess Mako. Um, and it's an acrostic poem from an acrylic um, that I did that just reminded me of her. And um, it's called Mako. The dancers unfold their moon white arms inside a Japanese silk fan, music of cherry blossoms in wind. In the imperial garden, the emperor's flute trills. Okoto calls the grieving, smiling girl who knows and doesn't know where she is going. She has taken off her crown. Now she's invited to join the cranes, unfurling their wings above the water. A snow-softened mountain watches in the distance with the face of a god, her ancestor. I dance in hidden place. I dance on stage in the main world shrine, linking arms with dancers from other countries, singing hitotsu. We are all one. A woman raises her scarf in wind, circles above a sleeping child, sings love in the blue bright light. In the far left corner of the dancer's world, spirits are ascending. Two dragons blow fire in the east. Three court musicians follow fanning their long silk sleeves, which hide knives. A family of gold koi rise to the surface, hungry for what they no longer have. Their mouths open with a large, oh. The gold princess dances by the pond. She dances for everyone above and below the water, then bids farewell. The water is her mirror the dance repeats. And then the second one is called bamboo. It's a high boon, which means a story and then haiku. No one knows where they came from. The two bamboo stalks washed up on Redondo Beach, an enigma. No bamboo grew anywhere near the beach. My friends were intrigued by the mystery. They suspected the stalks had traveled from Japan, recalling pieces of wooden furniture found elsewhere on the sand, later traced to Japan after the tsunami. The stalks were pale as cadavers, drenched with water and saturated with salt. One friend thought they could not possibly be alive, but the other friend felt a whisper of hope, sensing at their core they were green. Either way, dead or alive, they were gifts from the gods the Pacific brought to them. So they carted the bamboo to the car, opened both back windows, stuck the long poles out either end, and drove them to the first friend's home. Her husband, who had an uncanny way with plants, would know what to do. Her husband stuck the stalks in a barrel, filled with compost and snow peas. Years went by. The snow peas didn't make it. One day, looking up the hill, my friend and her husband saw the wooden barrel had shattered on both ends. The shoots of lifeless bamboo had come to life, breaching their container. You cannot stop bamboo, the second friend said. It will keep growing, no matter what. 
This Christmas, as we gathered without masks around the dinner table, vaccinated and unvaccinated for the first time since the pandemic, we did our best to share accounts that would unite and not divide. The two friends smiled and recounted to me the story of the bamboo. Each friend and my friend's husband told a different story. They were all surprised by its resilience, but the second friend was the most enthusiastic. It had grown into a jungle that sways on the hill, she noted. The wind rushes through its leaves. Birds fly in and out of its shade. How beautiful the bamboo had become. She paused and repeated once again, you can never stop bamboo. Holiday blessing. After months of hiding, our smiles break through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tricia Faye Hefner. You still here? I am, and my apologies. I <laughs> was just about ready to get up, of course. Um, but I do have a poem, and I just have the one, and I wanted to also say uh, thank you, Robbie, for putting this together, and um, Melissa and Lois, uh, just such a delight to hear both of you. Um, it's really wonderful. Uh, and I'll just let everyone know that um, his poem about ready to read is somewhat inspired by the poet Megan Sterling, and uh, she was on our Poetry Salon um, podcast, so I, I want to uh, invite you all to go check her out and just look up the Poetry Salon cast, and she's going to be teaching a workshop on modern day sonnets for us tomorrow, so if anyone's interested in that, please let me know. And I'll send you the information. Okay, I found the poem. This is just called uh, An Argument for Why I'm Not Writing. Surprised by solitude, it enters the city like a sunken sun. The sadness of doves sitting inside the face of the cosmos. Shadows have come all this way just to curl onto my chest, and the day closes its mouth, looks into the face of a lake. You want to open yourself to music, to fill with the sounds of night birds blowing trumpets, but the mouth of the universe will not be filled by your tiny lexicon. Something is happening in the star gardens above you. Donate your tongue to its silence. Become the solitude of doves, the sadness inside sadness, a firefly blinking against the quiet's perfect glass door. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tresha. Jim, would you like to read uh, now or last? Let me go last, please. Okay. I've decided to steal back my spot and to read a couple of poems. Since Melissa mentioned her llama, I've been semi-obsessed with llamas for a while. So I have this poem. Um, I read a small article in the New York Times talking about a substance that comes from llamas that may be a potential cure for COVID. So I wrote this poem, Research. Someone said that research is a blind date with knowledge. Take llamas. I've always liked their silly smiles, their loopy, loping gait. But today, I read that something they produce might be the best defense yet against COVID. That must be why the beasts are smiling, why they're generally relaxed, chewing their cud, standing in a field as though trouble 
were the last thing on their minds. When the unexpected upends everything you think you know, that's when you're hitting pay dirt. Think of Galileo discovering that Earth and all the people on it were just a pinprick in the universe. You think you're standing on solid ground. It's actually in flux. I'm not sure what keeps us all from falling through into the whir of particles, like the workings of a giant trash truck. Learning is a thrill ride, fraught and frightening, frequently disturbing. How many losers must one date before the right person walks into the bar. Unexpected and inevitable, a tribute to the universe with its endless stockpile of surprise. And my second one, here there be dragons. Once maps ended at the edge of the world, these unknown places spawned unruly spirits, vapors issuing from cracks in the packed earth, magnetic shifts that make a nonsense of the ordinary east and west. These open spaces thrilled us by breaking all the rules. Near strange Sedona, saguaro cactuses the size of trees offer arms of full, full of white blossoms to the bees. It's said that energy still gathers there, just beneath the surface, unloosing light shows in the sky, dinosaurs and aliens, as documented in a secret archive no one has ever seen. Trace this to Broadman's area number nine, part of the frontal cortex responsible for seeing a line of sense into the world, picking constellations out of a star-packed sky. Remember those bright flashes people saw at dusk in downtown Tuscaloosa over the deserted Walmart? The perfect circles burned into a field of broken corn stalks, metal monolith, high on some Wyoming ridge. We're all looking for traces of the ones who left them. No one on earth could burn a circle quite that perfect. Now hundreds show up on that godforsaken ridge with Geiger counters, magnifying glasses, seeking a clue, just hoping to be transported to somewhere else more congenial than our world. Thank you. Our last reader is the estimable Jim Lewis. First, I want to say thank you to Robbie because she has been so consistently good about organizing these readings. Um, the people she has invited have just been spectacular. And I noticed, Melissa, you submitted to Verse Virtual in its early days, and I would love to see something from you again. Lois, I don't think I've seen anything from you in First Virtual. I would love to see something of yours in one of our upcoming issues. So I have a single poem to read to you that, um, like many poems recently, has been sparked by a comment that someone made that just sort of clicked with me. The title is called Broken Toothed and Waiting for the Novocaine. Isn't it just like my whole life's been? Something breaks that I can't fix myself, and I end up waiting in one chair or another where the cure, though it promises relief, always comes with its own measure of pain. It was in high school, as I recall, when I fell in love with what's her name, chased her mercilessly with poems, songs, anything I thought would bring her around. But when it came time for a field trip, Who's she sitting by on the bus? Yep, my best friend. That was cruel, especially when he shrugged his shoulders and mumbled, well, she said she likes me. What was I supposed to do? We're still friends. I don't know where she ended up. It wasn't with him. 
broken heart, broken tooth, broken mind, they're all the same, unfixable alone. So you'll find me parked in some reclining chair, broken toothed and waiting for the Novocaine. Seriously, where's that Novocaine? Sorry about your tooth. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great reading. Uh, I think every month, I think it can't get any better, and it always does. And that's thanks to all the wonderful people in this community and the excellent features. And today, you were just spectacular. So thank you again for reading your wonderful work. And I hope to see you again. And I should say that one of our own here, Penelope Moffitt, will be featuring at the Spoken Word Reading this coming Tuesday at 1 o'clock Pacific time. And um, you'll find an invitation uh, on my, or a post at least, on my Facebook page. Um, so you're all invited to register and to come, and there's an open mic that is a little larger than, than this one. So hope that some of you can come. And if not, it's the fourth Tuesday of, of every month, and we have some wonderful features. So uh, we'll see you again next month. I don't know yet. I don't remember the date um, of next month's reading, but um, I'll be posting about it very soon. Thank you again to all of you and hope to see you again. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> yes, indeed, thank you. Our max attendance today was 39. It's the best attended. That was beautiful, you, Robbie. Robbie. Uh, wonderful you. features, wonderful poems. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for coming. Thank so you. long. Thanks, Robbie. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.